Hello all, this is Ben and welcome back to the Uncharted X podcast. This is episode number five. Uh, it's a the audio recording from the latest video that I uploaded. It's an interview with Yusuf Awan. Uh, I am trying to get podcasts out as I upload videos as well as working through my back catalogue. So uh, plans for upcoming podcasts are basically going to be most of my interviews that I've done with guys like Randall Carlson, um, Chris Dunn, Martin Sweatman, those types of things, all of the, the, the interviews that are on my channel. And then I, I hope to also keep pace with, uh, with the releases as I make them. So if you don't know Yusuf and anybody who's watched my channel or some of my work before should know Yusuf. Uh, he's an expert stonemason guide, a musician. Uh, he's a friend of mine. Uh, he works out of Egypt. He's, he's someone that I value uh, the opinion of greatly when it comes to evaluating the evidence for ancient high technology. Uh, he knows an awful lot about Egypt. Uh, I will let this interview play here because I do go on and, inter uh, and basically introduce him again uh, in the YouTube video. The one thing I wanted to say uh, for this is that there is a little bit of background noise you'll hear during the interview. There was a, a it was the height of summer in Egypt, and it, there was a fan uh, rotating overhead. So I hope that's not too much to make it difficult to listen to. I don't have a problem understanding him or listening to it. Uh, I did try to do some noise reduction on it, but it made all of our voices sound a little bit too tinny. Uh, but in any case, I do hope you enjoy the video. Uh, if you're looking for the visuals to this, because we do talk about a couple of things that I actually show uh, in the YouTube video, you can find all of that stuff on my YouTube channel and, of course, linked on my website, which is unchartedx.com. Cheers. Hello all, this is Ben and welcome back to Uncharted X. I've got an interesting video for you here today, something that I've been meaning to release for some time. This is a continuation of an interview that we held in Egypt a few years back with Yusuf Aywan. If you're at all familiar with my channel, then Yusuf won't be a stranger to you. Uh, for those of you who don't know him, Yusuf is one of the premier guides in all of Egypt. He's a friend of mine. He's a real expert when it comes to a lot of the megalithic structures and the evidence for ancient high technology that can be found on sites and objects all throughout Egypt. Yusuf has spent his entire life studying the mysteries of Egypt. He's an accomplished stonemason, so he understands the practicalities of what it takes to work in a lot of the material. He does so himself. He's used both traditional methods and modern power tools and, and those types of things. So he really understands the machining marks and the objects that we're looking at. He's also an accomplished musician. He's the guy that I recommend to most people that want to visit Egypt and hire a tour guide that's going to give you both sides of the mysteries of Egypt, both the orthodox establishment view on it as well as the alternative views, including showing you all of the evidence for ancient high technology. I've learned an awful lot from Yusuf over the years as I've traveled through Egypt and spent a fair bit of time with him, and I really value his perspective on these things. This interview is a continuation of the interview that you can find in one of my previous videos, something that I call the Zappy interview. It's an experiment that we did looking at what happens when you pass high voltages through different types of megalithic stone. If you haven't checked out that video, I'd recommend you do so before watching this one. It'll set up some of the context for some of the things that we discuss here, but I'll also spend a bit of time explaining some of the context behind what we're talking about and giving my opinion on what we're looking at. As I said, I've been meaning to release this for a while. I actually have a couple more hours of interview footage with both Yusuf and uh, his partner, the guy he used to work with, Mohammed Ibrahim, who runs the Guide of Egypt company now. And you can look forward to seeing those interviews released in the near future. We conducted this interview while we were sitting in Yusuf's shop. A lot of the artifacts and stonework that you see around us were handmade by Yusuf and his family. Uh, the shop's located basically across the road from the Sphinx. It's where he grew up. He spent his childhood playing around these areas. His dad was Hakim El Aywan. Some of you may recognize that name. He was one of the legendary guides, uh, or I guess of the, the last generation in Egypt. He's also been Stephen Mailer's teacher and responsible for the entire chemotology school. It's probably also worth noting that while Yusuf was taught by his father, he doesn't agree with everything his father says. He has formed a lot of his own views on all of these topics, and I hope you find what he has to say worthwhile. So on the day that we filmed this interview, it was done in the evening, we had been out visiting Abu Sir and Abu Ghraib. 
These are Old Kingdom sites. They're located uh, right in the pyramid belt there, I think between Giza and Dashur. And you know these are these are rarely seen sites. They're not really open to uh, public visitations. You need special permissions to enter them. Uh, we will be visiting these sites uh, on my upcoming tour. I think they've got some of the, the best examples of ancient high technology, certainly as it relates to the Old Kingdom sites. At Abu Sir, you can find some of the best examples of how different types of megalithic stone, like granite, basalt, and limestone, uh, have been used together and kind of layered together. We we also see this type of thing in at Giza and at other sites, particularly the Valley Temple at Giza. You have there, you've got uh, limestone that's been cased in granite, and at Abu Sir, you have limestone that's been cased in basalt. And there's some really odd effects and this crumbling effect that happens to the basalt, which is this you know plutonic volcanic stone. It's not really an effect that should happen naturally. And the weird thing about this is, is that you find this crumbling effect has, has occurred to the basalt on the inner joins uh, where that stone has been touching the limestone in the original casing. And of course, some of that has been broken and peeled away now. Um, so you, you can kind of see so there's been some strange effects that have happened to the basalt uh, over time or at some point in the past. And in the previous video that I'd mentioned, we get into some of the details about this and what possibly could have happened in order to cause uh, this effect. So again, if you haven't seen that previous video that we discussed that, it's going to help set up some of the context for the rest of this interview. You can find a link to that experiment video on the top corner of the screen right now, and there'll also be a link to it below. The first object that we're discussing here is one of the more interesting things you can find at Abu Sir, and one of my favorite little examples of just some incredible masonry work, and it's something that's very unique, I haven't seen this anywhere else, is a particular box that you can find that's down in a lower area of what used to be a mastaba at Abu Sir. It was all previously covered over by a roof, but today it's open to the sky, and you have to kind of slither down this descending passageway that's roughly the same size and shape as the descending passageways that you find in a lot of pyramids, say like three to four feet square, and after you slide down into this now open area, you can find a couple of just incredible granite coffers or boxes. One of these boxes is particularly interesting to me because it has what is basically a limestone inner casing. So you've got a granite box that's been made that looks very much like a precision box of the type that you see in the Serapium and in other areas. It shows all those sort of classic signs of uh, precision work with very flat surfaces, perfect corners, uh, and, and what looks to be very accurate geometry. What's interesting about this box is it has a limestone inner casing. So there's it's kind of a box in a box, if you like. There's a, a limestone box that has been fitted as a liner into this granite box. And in areas of this limestone inner casing have some of it's broken off. So you can actually see how perfect the fit was. And you can see kind of the intent of putting this uh, limestone in a box into it. It's a really curious phenomena. I think it's something that's very interesting and unique. I don't know of any other box like this that has a limestone in a casing. Of course, it's possible that uh, many of these boxes may have had this and this limestone was removed at some point in the past. But I think it's an interesting thought exercise to consider what may have been a possible functional purpose for this limestone, particularly when you look at some of the effects and the properties that these different types of stone have and how they've been combined in not only boxes like this one, but also in the megalithic architecture that we typically see on Old Kingdom sites. So, so then also the boxes, like that's the, the box at Abu Sir, you've got a granite exterior and a lining with that's made of limestone. Um, and it's a small box too. Small box. I mean the interior is small. It's a large exterior. The oh, you're talking about the mastaba. The mastaba. The, 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 the box. two boxes. Which, which box? well, yes, yeah, it's, it's very small too. The space in it is very small for a human body. For it. It's, yeah, it is. These and there are no are writings good. on it. And yeah. The, the one uh, where you, you slide down into you know, the passageway and then the yeah. two. That's and it, yeah. The, yeah. One, one of them just has that, it's lined with that limestone box. Inside, inside the, the small one. And yeah. And it's perfect. Yeah. Like it, there's no gap in between. It's, yeah. But, you know, there's obviously something they were putting in there that wasn't a body for some purpose. Nobody, uh, many boxes were found empty. 
Many pyramids were found empty in the inside, so how can we? Well, I just think there's something sure. to these, these boxes that you find in Egypt that are just, it hits at something functional, like that, that requires such massive weight and or particular a combination of, of stones that have different properties. I mean, there's no, I mean, there's no limestone in the boxes in the Serapine, for example, but they're yeah. just so massive compared to this. I mean, yeah. yeah, whether there's some reaction. The machining also different. on the surface of the pyramid, uh, or if we can call it the old kingdom or the pyramid builders era, has that uh, marking like what we saw today in the unfinished books yes. and inside the Great Pyramid itself. So, yeah. uh, no doubt that that lost the technology was used in it. So. Yeah. Yeah. Harun, my brother, he's fascinated with this machine. He loves it so much. <laughs> he made, can make it? He's the one who made like this device, as I told you. And yeah. He also well, great it's, Yeah, it was. I mean, I, I was but all quite, yeah. in, quite yeah. impressed that, that the basalt, the reaction with the basalt became so much stronger once it was around the, the limestone. The limestone. Yeah. Perhaps that's why the combination is there to achieve something. It's like one stone can amplify, and I believe the limestone is running through the entire structure. Yeah. So that's something that will, well, you know, like like a wire. And, and then you have the fluid as well. You've got liquid involved in this somehow with the, yeah. with the train, so it's water. Or, I mean. And we also know about that basin in uh, in the temple structure of uh, New Sarra. Mm. Supposedly, is a s labeled as a sewer system, right. and there is that so. channel yeah. carved from quartzite. We know that there used to be copper pipes running in it, and the liquid was running in it to the basin. And the basin has no, no point to release any liquid. Yes. So yeah. Is this more of a sewer system to get rid of the liquid, or, or a system to contain the liquid? Right. That's like you know. I just want to pause here and explain a little about what Yusuf means when he's talking about the Temple of Nusra and the Quartzite Bowl and the channeled blocks. Nusra is Abu Sir, and what he's talking about is really an interesting phenomenon that is present on many of the Old Kingdom sites, but really represented nowhere better than Abu Sir. At this place, you'll see, if you look around closely, a system of channeled blocks that is in the floor, and it's likely that these once held copper piping. And these aren't at the floor level, they're actually below what was the original floor level, be that machined basalt at the case of Abu Sir, or in some places it's limestone or it's granite, but typically these channeled blocks are a couple of feet below the actual floor level. They're built into these uh, structures for some reason. You can see these channeled blocks here in the jumble of the broken and quarried stone that's shown at Abu Sir. Just look for these channeled blocks on the floor and the camera kind of follows the path around. From the blocks that remain here at Abu Sir, if you investigate them and follow them around the site, the one impression that I get from it is that it was quite an extensive system that likely ran across most of this site. The mainstream fairly typically, I suppose, labels this as a sewer system. And maybe this is a little bit because they can't actually call it ceremonial, which is what everything else apparently always is. But because this system of channel blocks is beneath the floor, it's something that they have to actually admit must have had a functional purpose. Calling it a sewer uh, really doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. For one, it's, you know, no one was actually supposed to have lived on these sites. They're necropolises, they're tombs for kings and princes, uh, either that or their so-called ceremonial spaces, which is what everything else is. But in any case, these aren't, you know, places where people lived and not really an area that you'd need a septic or a sewer system. It also really doesn't make sense because in one area at Abu Sir, you can see this quite clearly, the channeled block system actually exits from the structure itself and empties into what is a quartzite basin. And this basin has no release mechanism. And is this really how we think that the builders of this site wanted to collect sewer waste? In a small or relatively small stone basin with no observable drain from it? It just doesn't make any sense. Here's something else that is interesting at Abu Sir. These channeled blocks can also be found way down the end of the causeway that leads up to Abu Sir, and it presumably it extended this whole piping system underneath the causeway with it. You can see that in this shot here. In ancient times, this area would have been absolutely connected to a water source. It may have actually been leading down into the uh, the river itself. 
It's still something of a small green oasis that sits at the very edge of the desert today and there's clearly groundwater nearby here. As I think I mentioned in the interview question with Yusuf, the presence of water is something that is often associated with ancient megalithic sites. So if we, you know, and just for a moment, we can speculate and perhaps entertain the hypothesis that these sites were somehow originally functional rather than ceremonial. And in that case, perhaps this connection to water and the piping system that is underneath the floor here might have had something to do with it. Another point, and this is very interesting, you can also find remnants of similar systems at many of the other Old Kingdom sites. These clues and the blocks that are remaining are really few and far between, as you know, typically these stones are made from alabaster or quartzite, and most of them have long since been quarried and taken away from the site. But if you look closely, they can be found. Here's a channeled block that's very similar to the ones at Abu Siyah that is right next to the Bent Pyramid at Dashur. And there really isn't much left around the pyramids of Dashur, but at some point in the past there were columns, there were you know, entire uh, courtyards, and likely something that looked much like the site at Abu Siyah, and clearly there was a channeled block system running under it. And of course Dashur itself is an Old Kingdom site. The pyramids there are supposedly older than the ones at Giza. Here's another example of a channeled block, this time at Saqqara, which of course is another Old Kingdom site, this one even older if you go by the orthodox explanation for these places. The Step Pyramid is located here, which was supposedly the first pyramid. I also know that these blocks have been found at Giza. So it's something of an interesting thought exercise. What were these blocks and this channeling system originally used for? The simple label of a sewer system seems to have really done its job in closing down a lot of natural curiosity about it, but it really doesn't make any sense when you think about it. Even in the Orthodox world, these sites weren't apartment blocks, they're not housing, they were just, they were tombs, they were necropolises, or they were sacred ceremonial centres, and you just don't have need for a planned sewer system that's been made from carved stone and housed several feet below the floor level. I think there's much more to this than meets the eye, and at least to me, it seems like something that is far more functional. This whole idea of it being a sewer system also gets to the principle of how labels are used when we view history through the lens of our own perspective in today's times. I think using labels like this can really be misleading at times, and when you think about it, labels are used to do this in many aspects of ancient history. It's one of the reasons that I think a more open-minded approach to investigating these topics will ultimately get us closer to the truth. Yeah, like when you label there, something, right? then you see it through the label, and that sometimes can mislead. If you label it as something, then that's how we're going to think of it, but perhaps it has another function. Or Maybe another. they're doing something to the water. It's either some kind of energizer. Or I heard or this from uh, from a friend once uh, when we talked about the water. And of course, the water is mentioned in the myth of creation, the primordial water, where yeah. everything is created from. So water can heal the planet. If you heal the water, and the water will heal earth and the plants and the plants will heal us. Yeah. So yeah, that's one part of it. Yeah. Running it through this process, benefiting from the different energies. That's a very limited part. Perhaps this can be part of the abilities of this water life. So we like what, what, what we use for baptizing or purification also. Yeah. Hmm? Right. But uh, of course it's a very small part of the entire complex. So inside the complex, perhaps it was achieving something else. Right. Even on its own that it can be used for purification or healing. Hmm? Yeah, it may have been more complicated than a single purpose. Right? It may have been a number of functions for this. Who to say? It's hard to say. Yeah. Take the pyramid, for example. <laughs> the label is a tomb. Yeah. But everything in it matches the myth of creation, the primordial mound, the primordial water, the bendy, all this. All these are elements of, in the myth of creation from uh, Ion yeah. or Heliopolis, hmm? city of the sun. So something that's uh, like a transfiguration of the, of the myth of creation, but it's labeled for death. Yeah. 
So through this label we look, hmm? right. we're supposed to be looking at something that's about life. Well, we have a label that says death. But the label says death. That's well, just a thought. It doesn't feel like a tomb. Yeah. You go in that place, it does not feel like a tomb. Yeah. It's a different energy. That's strange enough. Uh, I was um, reading in the dictionary about the symbol. You know the, the Great Pyramid labeled as um, Achit. The Pyramid of Achit. Achit Mir. And uh, the word Achit is believed to mean many things. Also depends on the position in the uh, dialogue. That can mean more than one thing. So uh, it's famous to be the horizon. This is the most famous. But in the Vigus Dictionary, I read also another um, explanation for it. Uh, and it's both spiritual power and intellectual ability. It's, um, it cannot be a coincidence, that explanation for that symbol or for this word. Because um, personally, I feel something like that when I visit these sites. I feel that it fed uh, something energetically in me. And also, I feel that it gave me some kind of intelligence, really, or awareness or something like that. So, and I was amazed when I saw the explanation of this word. You know, like both together, and it's the name of the Great Pyramid, yeah. yeah. I think that's <laughs> at least part of what it does to you, it gives you energetic power. We don't, spiritual, of course, we don't know, most of people like, can be confused with something emotional, and they can call it spiritual, in my opinion, of course. But uh, profound. Yeah, that, right, yeah. Profound. Maybe what can be explained as a spiritual is something just more energetic. Hmm? Yeah. yeah. Again, the label and what does it really mean? Hmm? Yeah. Everybody feels it. Yeah, it's definitely energy in a lot of these sites. I mean. Yeah. Yeah, the shape, the angle, the alignment, all this it cannot be a coincidence. Something no. um, that complicated. Hmm? It, it's definitely a connection too between, I mean, wherever there's a hotel, there's something special about that place, it seems like, for whatever reason. Yeah. There's something very interesting nearby. Yeah. Well, uh, as we were talking also, in my opinion, if we have um, era after era, and these eras are inheriting something and reusing it the way they can benefit from it. And this happened throughout the ages. And if we find hotibs, like many ones we saw that reflecting the loss of technology and others that's not, then we can uh, think that um, the inheritors copied something for the new idea. It became uh, useful, especially, for example, um, that it's for offering. And we know <coughs> how the priest worked hard in every way to collect offerings. So yeah. the more hotibs, the more offerings. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So. Perhaps the, the older one that's reflecting the powerful machine were also uh, used for a different purpose or to achieve something different. And we don't want to think of it as everything because still it's a device in a big complex full of devices. And lots of it is missing too. We know if anything was made of gold or silver or electron yes. or good right. types of stones. It's gone a long it time ago. Well, you know, at least... <laughs> 2,500 years ago, if they're still in. Yeah, I mean, wasn't there a layer in that, that, that Electron was in uh, the, the Mexican pyramids, right? At Tenochtitlan, Chile, there was a layer of some metal inlaid into right. one of the levels of the pyramid. It was removed in mm. the 20th century. Most of the obelisks as well, and uh, this is from official books, of course, used to have uh, Electron. Electron? Yeah, which is a blend between gold and silver on the peak. It's yeah. a very uh, powerful. Uh, Imagine method. if those things were standing in a time when, or they were built in a time again, if the Sphinx encountered a lot of rainfall, if it might have been a tropical area with a lot of thunderstorms, right? What's an, what's an obelisk if not, that's covered in electrum, if not a massive 
lightning rod in an, perhaps in an area of the world back then, mm. if you take Robert Schock's theory, right, that maybe that was, they were conducting electricity, maybe they were connected to the system. I don't know. Yeah, and also, that's a hell of um, a there are many light. types of uh, activations that's silent, without any, like, uh, loud sound or, or brightness or anything like that. It's just the tool in its right location, in its right alignment, Frequency. from the right material, and the, 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 the geometry of it hmm, can yeah. create a, an activation, take the pyramid, yeah, yeah. for example. And the pyramid has the same function, or the bimbin has the same function like the pyramid. And the obelisk is not um, a different device. It's another form of the bimbin, is the obelisk. These, these tools are very ancient. And the writings on it cannot also explain what it means because most of the writings were added uh, by Ramses. So he, he usually they say, I made this for my father, Amun Ra, hmm? the Lord of uh, Karnak Temple, or, hmm? yeah. and like this kind of things. And uh, we have cases. Um, like one for Miriam Bitah in Karnak Temple. The writings are cruder than, than other writings. So writings was added above all the writings. So the newer writings say that Miriam Bitah, the Lord of the Two Lands, made that monument for his father. And the, that part of that obelisk is laying in the entrance of Karnak Temple. It just needs an expert to realize the difference in carving even different levels of uh, carving the hieroglyphs. The older one is usually better. And the one that's added later, as we saw today in the museum, many examples, many examples is usually cruder in, yeah. in the way it's carved. This topic is one that I always think it's worthwhile to reinforce. And that is you can't really date any of the objects in ancient Egypt by what's written on them. This is a topic I've explored in several of my videos, most notably probably the video about Tanis, uh, that just has example after example after example of, you know, uh, particularly Ramses the Great uh, basically defacing and writing over more ancient writing on them. We also see this as a good example in the Serapium, where you have the, the style of writing that you find on the boxes is extremely poor and doesn't at all compare to the technology that's involved in making the monuments themselves. That said, that typically is how many of these objects are dated by the last person that wrote their name on them. Uh, it's, it's kind of an illogical way of going about it. You really can't say that whoever wrote on this was also the person that, that made the object. It's certainly possible that many of these objects existed for long before anybody took the time to start whaling on them with a primitive you know, copper chisel or a flint knife and a hammer. Because the writings were done with you know, primitive tools, copper chisels, those types of things, it's then somehow an extension to assume that all of the objects in Egypt were made with copper chisels and hammers and flint knives, but you just there's really no way that you can achieve the levels of precision and magnitude that we see in some of these objects, particularly the ones crafted out of very hard stone. It's the strange thing about Egypt comes out of, you know, the, the, the official story is that it comes out of nowhere, just perfect. And Many of the official stories are mentioning this, but what what is the result that you understand from that? Hmm? Like from the official stories, the oldest um, timeline that they realized of recycling stones was the Middle Kingdom, 2100. But there is a conflict with that. Also, official books are mentioning that. In the Middle Kingdom, they evolved in quarrying stone that they were able to carve it out of the bedrock. Hmm? So, which one can we believe? Of course, the one that is there in the field, the evidence that they recycled the stone, because the other one is not, and there is no solid evidence. It's more, it's more to theories. They believed also, again, I will say this, because I don't believe it. They believe that the old kingdom didn't hack, or the, the pyramid builders didn't hack, didn't quarry from the mother rock, and they depended on falling pieces and stuff like that. I think this is a big mistake. Definitely, they worked 
from the core, the quality of the granite stone especially, you know, not like the surface ones. The surface ones are crumbling. Second, the, 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 the results of like 16 pillars, all the same measurements, no extensions and things like that. This reflects that those who are carving these stones, they have a total power. They have control. They, they want to accomplish something, they accomplish it. All the same measurement. You know how challenging is this? Pillars that's over five and a half meters. Where do you find 16 pillars? Like, you know, 16 pieces yeah. that you can make 16 pillars out of. The crown is a single solid piece with the pillar, not like the Roman pillars. Made, yeah, yeah. The pillars in the pyramid structures are single solid piece. That palm shaped pillar is very, very challenging. Of course, the piece itself was as big as the width of, of the, the crown, of the palm, of the, of the crown, yeah, of the pillar. And then the base of it is wide. And then it keeps going narrower, narrower, narrower like this. And then the pillar is crowned as on top of it. Very, very, very challenging. You can find it in the sites that's dated or they related to the 5th dynasty especially. And um, that's of course according to the writing. Even that we saw pillars from Winnie's structure, the, the pyramid in Sakara, from that uh, open court of it. and. Um, still has crude writings on the pillars, but that's how they were dated and related. The writings look so crude, doesn't fit with somebody who have the capability of creating a three-dimensional piece of art class, and then he will do the writings this poor. Don't tell me that they run out of time or something like that, or tools. Hmm? But where are the tools? And that's the mystery. Where are the tools hmm, that can accomplish this? We found copper chisels. So we want to give any explanation that can make the copper chisel be able somehow to carve a granite. Forget it. There is another tool that you don't know about, that we don't know about. And we see some results of it. Some results of powerful tools, like tubular drills and circular so on. You know? The scooping, the rough one, which we see it, of course, in many different sites around the world. It's in South America, it's in Egypt, uh, many places in Egypt. And this is a very good point. The scooping marking that's in the quarry, you can see it in the back of the blocks of the granite at the third pyramid. So how come they didn't have the technique to quarry from the bedrock? Hmm? Just because the officials maybe believe that they only had copper chisels and they want to shape the theory so how can copper chisels fit in that part and just call it a day what about these ones uh, maybe it's maybe it was something you know <laughs> what about this machine that actually the original builders used hmm? uh, perhaps it was a, a copper saw with some powder sand or something silica sand Good luck with that. Really. And these curves, and this sharpness, and this, and the inside of the box. How did you sew the inside of the box? Hmm? So, uh, any engineer will hear these theories, of course. We wouldn't be surprised if they laughed about it. Hmm? And, uh, yeah, so, lots, lots was accomplished as we also saw by the dynastic Egyptians. We saw unfinished statues and things like that from the new kingdom and stuff like that but um, and from the old kingdom of course as well and colossal statues they are reflecting the manual school of art so um, we are not saying that the dynastic Egyptians were not able no and what I'm trying to say here is that there was more tools than we think and the timeline also is not as accurate as we think that's a matter so this timeline can go further to more intermediate periods. The, some official books mentions that there is an intermediate period or a, a lost link in the pre-dynastic time. And this, um, they realize 
from the difference in skeletons of the body. So the the race, the human race that that was found in the burials of the pre-dynastic time, especially in the south, is different from the human race in the dynasty. How long did that take one? What, what happened at that point? Hmm? Nobody um, talks uh, more because if we want to uh, see how the civilization evolved to accomplish this. Hmm? There are a couple of points worth reinforcing here. Firstly, the point around tools. And what Yusuf states is, I think, a uh, a piece that sometimes gets lost in the discussion between orthodox and establishment and and alternative perspectives is that many of the alternative views you know we're not we're not saying that the dynastic egyptians were not capable of doing great things and achieving great outcomes uh, they certainly were and they made many incredible structures in the middle kingdom and the new kingdom and they did so with the primitive tools and methods that are ascribed to them. You just can't take those same primitive tools and methods and apply them across everything that we see in ancient Egypt. There were certainly those tools and methods were used on many of these objects. That's where some of the confusion comes from. Uh, a lot of the inheritance and the reuse and the renovation of both objects and sites lends to that to that idea. But there's just many, many areas of evidence across both objects and sites that suggest that there were other tools involved in this and tools that had capabilities beyond what we know the primitive tools of the dynastic Egyptians could achieve. And this is what lends a lot of credence, I think, to the argument that there was a, uh, a more advanced civilization at some point deeper in our history. And Yusuf brings up another point after that, and this is a mainstream discussion that comes up from time to time, and it's something that's continually being investigated, is that there seems to be a missing period with pre-dynastic Egypt, or the period that occurred before the dynastic civilization arose as we know it. The evidence for this comes from the uh, analysis of the human remains that have been uncovered in these pre-dynastic areas. There's, there's almost as if there's been some evolution or a period of time where human evolution has occurred in this period. And again, this lends itself to the idea of a much longer history that we currently attribute to the ancient Egyptian civilization. Just a quick note here, we had to change batteries in the camera here. That takes a couple of minutes to get everything up and running. So some of the noise you'll hear and the fact we can't see Yusuf, uh, that's the reason for it. And the interview video will be back in a couple of minutes. And we saw to the thing is that like many, many, many questions. In the burials of the pre-dynastic time, pottery, okay. uh, vases of jars were made by hand side by side with other vessels, you saw it, I know. Mm -hmm. Amethyst, slate from the pre-dynastic time, Persia, Basel, and you can still see the marking, which is not far from what we see right here. <laughs> yeah, which no? was made with the machine, right? <laughs> the other one was finer, too. Yeah. You see here the marking, you see, between the, each line. Huh? Yeah, yeah. The other one, was you can cut this or like you can draw at least five lines inside each one of those lines will get you the result of the tubular drill that we saw and a tubular drill that means the blade is very thin is it going to handle the heat and the pressure copper after it heats a little bit you know if you think it's manually like that and power tools that went deeper than the person who was working with it required, like in the, in the statues and... Yeah. You know, so. Not that the copper would do much against the granite anyway. Exactly. <laughs> so they think like some other theory thinks that by hammering, the copper becomes more solid and then they can... Hmm? But uh, one documentary I watched and I liked, they tried, I, I can mention the name, if you want to cut it later. Yeah. It's called Riddles of the Sphinx. Riddles of the Sphinx. You have seen? Have you seen this yeah, one? I think so. Yeah. In the movie, they wanted to prove that copper chisels carved no? the statues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what was the challenge? It was a beautiful challenge. They brought a team of professional carvers and they decided to make the tools 
you the pounders and the copper bars and they brought real thick bars to make the cheese it's not thin one like the ones we find in the in the museum and um, they wanted to achieve to uh, carve a nose like the <laughs> it's a beautiful challenge i liked it so um these thick uh, copper chisels that they made, they made it with the fire and then they brought the flints and the two pieces of wood and the wrap of leather, you know, to match what the dynastic Egyptians had in, in the old king. And they were carving, of course, limestone. <laughs> we're not talking about even uh, marble. Right, yeah. We're talking limestone, so you can think of, of granite later. Yeah. So what did they do? They started carving, first day, the, every time, like after three, four hits, that thick copper chisel bends, like, you know, <laughs> yeah, and they have to straighten it and start again. They're not progressing hmm, at all. Yeah. And I'm sure that limestone in that movie was much softer than the Neolithic. <laughs> That's right. very solid stone. This is yeah, as challenging as, as any of the other hard rocks, that, especially the Great Pyramid here. So, this someone like was hammering with the hammer and he, they said like oh maybe they started you know to, to remove that lots of stone that they need to to get the shape of a nose <laughs> so they started to pound with the pounders not with the copper chisels it's, it's progressing after like four days or something they had something like a big watermelon <laughs> shape <laughs> and they said this is impossible and they brought the power tools and they carved the nose on the move. So when they wanted to prove that it was done by copper chisels, they failed. Even that they brought professional uh, stone carvers. And the end, they used the compressor machine. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Yeah, just like, get it over with. <laughs> so, yeah, that's still limestone. So imagine if we... Granite, yeah. Vessel, there is, in my opinion, as a stone carver, there is only uh, one uh, tool that can do this, which is another type of stone that is harder than what. This is basic. That's, that's exactly what you need to do. Well, we use diamond, right? It's the hardest. Yeah, stone. we have here uh, uh, evidence. They say we don't have diamond here. Okay. Even if we didn't have diamond here, we did. We also brought the lapis from abroad. Hmm? The ancient, and this is one of my, like the things I believe, uh, like it happened more than we think as well, is that the ancient civilizations, I'm not talking ancient advanced, I'm talking ancient, normal pre-dynastic civilization in that era, they also traveled more than we think. They did travel, no doubt. They brought materials and they came back. He didn't just get out there and got lost. You know his way, that means he has like a, a way of, of knowing the path and the traveling and the experience, maybe with the stars, maybe with other signs that they, they knew, hmm? and things like that. So, yeah. no doubt that um, what we know about the ancient civilizations, even in the normal dynastic and the pre dynastic time, is not 100% uh, complete. I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. But let's see that it's not 100% complete. <laughs> Same like we see, like dating and relating by writings is not 100% correct. The more examples we see, it feels like there is more writings added later than the genuine one that was originally with the artifact. And we see many artifacts without writings. Hmm? Yeah, that's right. There's so many. There is just seems to be so many examples of obvious re reuse and rewriting that it becomes a little difficult to really judge anything by what's written on it, even yeah. if that's only what's written on it. Yeah, inheritance. Even there is a, a, a title that appeared more in the Greco-Roman era. It's, it's written in hieroglyphics, called Iwa, means the inheritor. And this right, this title is added to the names. Hmm? Yeah, Iwa. It's it's um, a, a bone with a flesh. This is how the sign looks like. It's not a it's not a coincidence, of course. Yeah. And from the old kingdom time, you find also a title to the priest called Khintish, means the settler. 
settings in, in some places. And you find overseas of the settlers' place titles for, of other priests hmm? and things like that. So you know that this was happening. Hmm? Even that we cannot depend on it, but we can. They they wrote it down. It's written down in, in that ancient era. Yeah. Because uh, today, would you go and claim that you build it? Yeah. No. Hmm? So you will be your truth. Hmm? Right. So. Yes. But some dared. Merim betah dared to say, I made that money to my father. You know, or even <laughs> so it was a lie. Yeah, different times. Yeah. We certainly claim things. Yeah. And make them our own. Officials also like to call it user. Right. I prefer the word inherited because I would I wouldn't feel guilty if I if I have the permit to myself. You know <laughs> what I mean? <laughs> no. Yeah. No. I would feel happy. I feel that yeah. You know, yeah. Our ancestor left us something That's right. Precious. Hmm? Let's go record some music. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. That was awesome. Thank you. Hey all. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I always find it to be a real pleasure to get to speak with Yusuf. I'm very much looking forward to seeing him again in a couple of weeks when my uh, next tour of Egypt starts. Uh, you know, touch wood that I can avoid the coof uh, for that long and actually get there. That'd be great. I will be recording a whole bunch when I'm over there and I also hope to release a couple of videos while I'm over there of just sort of daily updates and things like that. If not even being able to live stream, uh, we'll see how that goes. As always, wanted to say a huge thank you to everybody that does choose to support the channel through the value for value model. Uh, you guys are the reason I'm able to spend all the time making and editing these videos. If you're interested in that, if you like the work that I'm doing, all the details for it are on my website. It's unchartedx.com slash support. Some of you might have noticed the last thing that we said in this interview was, you know, let's go record some music. And that's exactly what we did uh, later that evening. So I thought I'd just play you out with one of the tracks that Yusuf laid down with his brother Sadat. Uh, I think it's uh, spectacular music and I've set it to some of the footage from Egypt. I hope you dig it. I certainly do. And I will see you guys all in the next one. Cheers. Mm -hmm.